Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recorded, recorded shows are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So that'd be similar to your state library. Um, so we provide services, training, consulting, et cetera, et cetera, to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Our, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Um, this today is the last Wednesday of the month, so that means it's Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Yay! <laughs> The last Wednesday of the month, uh, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, joins us. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. To tell us about um, cool techie things going on. Could be anything. And today she's going to talk about uh, last month's, right? Because it's November. Yeah. Uh, Internet yeah. Librarian 2022 Conference. Um, all the cool things that were there that you missed <laughs> if you were <laughs> unable to attend. <laughs> And even when you do attend, you can never go to everything. So it's kind of nice to see what else was out there. True, true. I mean, there's always that. Yeah, there's, there's you know, there's multiple tracks, as with any conference, yeah. uh, multiple things happening at the same time. So yeah, this is good to get a, a idea of what maybe you didn't see. So I'll hand it over to you, Amanda, to take it away and tell us all about it. So there was a lot going on there. And for those of you who didn't know, um, Internet Librarian is one of like kind of the leading tech conferences for librarians. And so this year it was actually run by Brian Fitchman because Jane was out sick for this one. She wasn't able to make it for whatever oh. reason. So Brian took over this one. He did an awesome job. Wow. And, Good job, Brian. And so in this case, I'm going to talk about there was a lot going on, so I just kind of plucked out some different trends and tracks. So in this overview session, I'll be talking about how libraries are starting to help communities work through their own problems in their own way. So right now, we're starting to shift over from more of a tackle one problem at a time to actually starting to address problems fully and systemically. How can the library help in that full problem solving process instead of just doing one little thing at a time, make it more comprehensive. And then the next trend that I'll be talking about is in order to make that more comprehensive and be able to do that full problem solving process, we need new ways of actually communicating, working together and working with our partner organizations within the community. And lots of that stuff is changing. So we'll kind of talk about some of the presenters that found new and awesome ways to do that. And then I'll talk about how technology and innovation is helping to change the game and offering new ways to solve those community problems mm -hmm. and how libraries are introducing new technologies, leveraging new technologies and changing the way they do things. And then to round it all out, it seems like every one of these conferences, they're trying to predict the future. They always have like a futurist or someone saying like, this is what's gonna go on. So I'll talk about kind of the changing trend of are we just trying to predict the future or do we actually have a hand in shaping the future and what can we do about that? All right, so I'll start by diving into in order to tackle community problems, I put in this little mini framework just to give you something familiar, something you've probably seen before. This is the design thinking process where when libraries are actually helping their community to work through problems like racial inequities or climate action, 
or insert your preferred problem here, it's actually a whole series of organizations working together to be able to tackle that, to address that problem. So you start by working as a community to understand and it kind of define what that problem's all about. And then you start figuring out, well, how do we work together to solve this? Which organizations are doing what? Can we join an existing effort or do we have to go shuffle over and try to create something new? What are the new technology tools that are available to help us kind of ideate and create new solutions that we wouldn't have known existed before? And then where can we go to actually test some of the stuff out? How can we start doing finding really cheap, fun, cool, quick ways to test out fail fast and do this as a community instead of just trying to work on these problems individually or one organization at a time? instead of duplicating efforts, how we work together. So that's kind of the primer that we'll use to kind of frame out this little recap for the whole conference. So let's look, this, is, this slide is a lot, but so let's kind of pick this apart a little bit. This little honeycomb is something that I put together after the whole conference was over because this whole thing didn't make a whole lot of sense until I was able to take a step back process and kind of put all the threads of everything together. So you go back here and say, as a community, we want to be able to understand other people's perspectives, empathize, and then define problems in a way that is workable, something we can do something about. So in library land and as a community as a whole, we're already doing this in a variety of different ways, but we don't always collect the information or use the information effectively. So some of the, a lot of the sessions talked about community conversations to start plucking out those problems that really matter to people. We've all mostly been doing like town hall meetings or different things like that to say, to kind of like air out our grievances and kind of put out what we care about. And a lot of times in writing groups, book discussions, we talk about what we care about. We talk about the pro our everyday problems and how it relates to the threads and themes that are coming out in our books, writing and everything. And another session that came out in the presentation is empathy, um, empathy building with virtual reality. There was a community that put together an entire like they put together an entire immersive experience in virtual reality to help people see the world from other people's perspectives. And like their session was actually called Cultivating Racial Equity and Inclusion Using VR. So if you start searching around for that and just looking for that experience, like that is one of the incredible ways that libraries can start helping to build that shared understanding of a problem. But there were quite a few libraries that said we're tackling our community problems when we introduce people to the problem using VR. But you're not actually completely tackling the problem when you just introduce the like introduce it and help build that shared understanding. Mm -hmm. You're tackling the problem when you help people work through the rest of this process. So what I found in a lot of these different sessions is that there was a tendency to say that when we help people empathize and come together to talk about the problem, we're tackling the problem, but you're not. So how do you actually bring people together to say, to go beyond just building that shared understanding to actually start ideating and prototyping? So when I started digging into what does the library do to help people share ideas build prototypes, test things out, and actually work through that whole process. And then you'll see that the number of activities got smaller. And the sessions that I saw and just like what I've seen just overall is occasionally community conversations and town hall meetings will shift over into ideation, but not always. Maker spaces sometimes have opportunities to ideate and prototype different designs. Like they say, you just found out that virtual reality existed and you want to be able to use it as a tool to solve a problem. Does your library offer an opportunity just to experiment and um, 
put on a headset and be able to immerse yourself in some pre-existing virtual world? Or do you also offer, offer opportunities to start developing your own content and connect with over whether with different learning pathways and partner organizations to possibly develop some system that solves a local problem? Um, virtual reality is really awesome for developing instructional services, for building over those empathy experiences. If you want to be able to, if you had a group in your community that was like an underrepresented group, like I'm Native American. So if you wanted to represent the Native American um, community and you had like a group that was really um, interested in using virtual reality to build like a storytelling session, like an immersive storytelling session, how as a library would you be able to connect them to the resources that would let them do that? So in a makerspace environment, how do you take that next stage to say, we're not just introducing the technology or introducing the problem, we're helping you work that whole, through that whole process. And in some cases I've seen, like some of the sessions showed that they had um, entrepreneurs that came in as guest speakers to the library, or they had like small business associations or different groups that came in that walked people through that process and offered to be a resource. And in some cases, um, some communities are starting to build learning hubs and resources like that. But it's not, most of it's not cohesive. It's kind of all over the place right now. So that's one of the changing trends is how do we actually start to bring all this together? And so that brings me over to, if you want to be able to basically see what I saw, um, Internet Librarian put together a page that has all the presentations. So in my little recap list, this is, you can think of this as my, it is my like sources listed, but most of like 90% of the presentations on here, I chose ones that actually made their slide deck available publicly on their, on the Internet Librarian website. So you can click through and if you're interested in any of these, then mm -hmm. cool. And I'll also kind of give like a brief blurb about you can help people build a shared understanding by building curated archives. Like there was a black digital archive that was telling some of like the, the black stories on campus in Pittsburgh. And I know that there's a bunch of those popping up. So you can start kind of take those archives and take it the next step of the way. And while you're mentioning slides, I will mention, so in case anyone asks, Yes, Amanda slides will be available with the recording after um, with this show as well. So um, all these things and the links she has there that find presentations here, you'll all have access to this yes. afterwards. And so in order for all of this to happen, a lot of stuff needs to change. So the next thing on here is how do you shift over from that disjointed chaos to actually working together and working smoothly across organizations and incorporating the library as part of a larger community that's working toward shared goals. So how does that, you have to basically make a lot of changes just to get to that point. So that was another big section of, that, of this conference was how do you restructure the library so that you can leverage your community partnerships and I don't know how many of you know about Simon Sinek, and I'm sure he's not the only one who said this, but he said that most organizations and most leaders don't know the game that they're playing. They don't know who else is working on the same problems and who else is working toward those shared goals. So, and a lot of you have probably also heard that we're starting to shift over from organization centric so instead of just thinking the library is our own little island and we're all about books and we are, we're doing our own thing, we're working in ecosystems. So we have an ecosystem that might be working toward improving tech access in the community. You have an ecosystem that's improving um, the climate change crisis, another ecosystem that's improving um, racial inequity in the workplace like insert a problem, insert a technology tool, you have an ecosystem that's working toward it. The library is just embedded within that ecosystem. And in some communities, you might be leading the ecosystem because 
you don't like your community doesn't even think in ecosystems and you don't think in systems. But the library more often than not is going to be joining an existing ecosystem and just uncovering what's already there. And then the other kind of general theme across this was how can the library play a role in building this like basically how do you build a knowledge repository? You have this hot mess of different topics that come from these different little disparate pieces. You have a bunch of different sources of information. Most of the sources of information is behind a paywall. If you have any conferences some paid webinars or like community conversations, usually it's a one and done, or if you weren't able to pay to play, you don't have access to the information. So one of the things is libraries are starting to build, like starting to aggregate some of that information. Um, my session at the conference was called library problems. So this is a big thing of what I talked about, which was how to braid those disparate pieces together and turn the library into the aggregated information that's going to bring together ecosystems to be able to address the problems that have been facing our communities for ever and a day. Like none of these problems are new, we're just changing the way that we're, we're dealing with them. And so the other thread is just overall, the way that we're addressing everything is changing. We've gone over to digital first. So in order to bring people together, offer shared resources, give everyone a voice, do the, whole, the equity, equality, and all the ease that are the buzzwords of the day, we're switching over to hybrid services. So it's not just focusing on the library as a place, we're shifting over to how do we revamp our websites and how do we make this a more appealing place to visit digitally? Because if you have a horrible website, people are just gonna click away. It's unfortunate and you might have the most amazing information on the planet, but half these sessions in here were about make your website look less. And then trying to help people rethink what the web, the, the library looks like. Um, I know you've all heard the library is more than just books. And I, I hate to say it again, but I'm going to do this in every session. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're going to be, most people don't think in ecosystems. I mm -hmm. like when I went to this conference and when I went to other, like talked to other people, I found out that I'm kind of a weirdo that does think in ecosystems. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't and think that, yeah. that make it totally makes sense to me, but <laughs> yeah, it's and I thought that it made sense to everyone. Like it's just I thought that people just looked at it and was like, yep, they're thinking in systems. And instead I started talking about it and going, <laughs> no, we don't. And <laughs> you know, so it's sort of, if your library used to be an island and your library used to just meet with a small group of people, like one representative from each different demographic and, and shaped your events and policies and procedures based on that, how do you let people know that the library has changed and is changing? And if you have revamped your website, how do you let people know that that is now a new thing? And if you now offer hybrid services that are trying to reach a wider audience, how do you reach those people? So, and then the other thing is, none of this change is going to happen if your organization is a hot mess. If you don't treat each other well, if you don't communicate information well, if you don't even have your own internal knowledge network that says, here's our information repository. If you want to know what's going on, go here. And if you don't have kind of like a change map to get your organization right first, then you're not going to be able to play nicely with other, with others. And you're going to be kind of behind the curve when, as everyone starts working together to do all the, all this cool stuff. Mm. And if you have like an organizational structure that says we're really top we're like a huge top down organization, you need to go through this person and this person to be able to share an idea 
then you're basically finding out that you're blocking innovation instead of supporting it. And there were just a bunch of sessions about how do you cultivate ideas and help your leadership and employees grow together. And that was, that's a good chunk of it. And so there's two sides to this. One is you have the organization that's shifting, but then you also have individuals that are trying to sort themselves out mm -hmm. because most libraries are trying to recruit new talent. They're trying to rebrand the library to job seekers to say, we're not boring, come over here. <laughs> and so right now, if you're like the library is not traditionally viewed as the, the center of innovation, like most of us know, there's a ton of innovation going on in libraries. We're using all the new cool technology. AI is a thing, Internet of Things is a thing. We have smart libraries, we're all over the place. But that's not true for every library. So if a job seeker's first experience was a shushy librarian that just wanted you to sit quietly with your book, then you need the library to have that growth mindset and advertise that growth mindset before you can re recruit the talent that has that growth mindset that you want to attract. It's hard to break that first impression. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just true for libraries. It's true for like, oh, it's true in sure. manufacturing, it's everywhere. And the other thing is that organizations are getting used to changing constantly, but individuals are also getting used to changing constantly. Um, the career cycle, as a lot of you know, has changed. Now people have up to like 11 different careers in their lifetime, like that was a Bureau of Labor statistic. And they're now a, like stuff's changing. And people aren't used to that rapid pace of change. They're not used to the fact that jobs that existed 10 years ago aren't going to exist in five or 10 years. And if you go to a four year degree and prepare for stuff, then in that fifth year, everything shifted and half of what you just learned in the past four years may be irrelevant. Huh. And especially in the land of tech, that's not necessarily always true in the general, like a managerial class or like something like that. But if it's tech stuff, that's usually like that chain, that cycle of change is changing. And there's also a greater emphasis on getting your mind right. It's, you're going to be dealing with constant change, uncertainty, and you need to have like a strong will, a strong support system. And if you want to be able to surround you, you want to be able to surround yourself with an environment that's going to be supportive enough that you can take time out to work on yourself, figure out your own priorities, values, and focus, and then figure out how you align that with an organization and how to avoid the organizations that are still kind of hot mess. <laughs> and so that's the whole thing. So if you want to go, this was a, there's a lot of sessions that talked about this. This is, there's probably even more from this list that I didn't even there's only so much that'll fit on a slide and not <laughs> everyone gave their presentation. So you can sift through this, find what's more helpful to you. I recommend going to the tech tools to transition to a hybrid work environment because that's going to be helpful to a lot of people. I'm not trying to make this slide deck the one slide deck to rule it all because I mean, that's why people put together their slides, use them. And so then the other one is from toxic to healthy, improving organizational culture and strategic tools to bridge to the future, because she talks about a lot about changing the needs assessment to the community, shifting cultural goals and kind of like practical ways to change how you do stuff. And then the remote customer service um, engagement and ghosting is a really good one. Um, Ghosting as a whole is one of my pet peeves. So it's like anytime I see that as a theme, I'm like, yes, let's do this thing. But <laughs> so that's a really good one to start looking into. And library problems is me. So I mean, shameless self promotion. <laughs> <laughs>
And so let's jump over to our next trend here, which was once you kind of start, once the library itself starts building that understanding of the overall problem solving process and starts understanding which problems are most relevant and then start shifting over to saying, this is the change that we need to make to become more innovative and become more attractive place to visit and a more attractive place to work. Then we start shifting over to say, there's some new stuff that people need to know. There's some tech, there's new technologies, there's new ways to innovate, there's new process improvements, there's new behavioral and cultural changes. We're changing at the library, but how do we introduce new technology into our communities so that the library can help our community be stronger? And so that's makerspaces. That's a that's the learning hub partnerships. That's the um, workforce development partnerships. That's anything that's helping your community to leverage technology to do some good and live a better life. So some of the tech trends that were going on are on the left hand side, the handy dandy little honeycomb is plucking out the types of technology that were featured in the conference and are just featured in general. I have a bunch of pages that are all about all this stuff. So of course I gravitated toward it at the conference, asked someone else, they probably paid attention to other stuff. But like AI, the Internet of Things was supporting like the smart city and like smart cities are in both rural communities and those big giant communities like New York. But they have like a whole bunch of different resources to help with that. And I talked about virtual reality being a way to build empathy and to help build that shared understanding. But you can also jump over to augmented reality to help in instructional design, entertainment, and just a mess of different stuff. There was a really awesome session about a community that designed a farm bot. So that was kind of like a practical application of someone who said, we need a better way to be able to automate our farming capabilities so that we can basically grow more food for grow to grow to support more people without having so many people necessary to monitor the equipment because we don't have a enough people that are interested in farming in our area to do that. Mm. So they built the farm bot both as a learning tool to show the process of how to design and build a robot, but also to meet a community need. So if you need a farm bot, cool. Some of it's open source. <laughs> and they also talk a lot about the future of blockchain. So it's, this is all of that new fancy emerging technology that people are trying to find out where it fits. So in the role of a library, um, most, of the, most of the sessions were about finding new ways to provide access to the technology. Most of the makerspace sessions on this list were about how do we start building makerspaces to support that hybrid environment that is we're not always just a physical environment we're also a digital resource repository and we provide um, remote access to all these resources because a lot of this stuff you don't actually need to be on site to be able to do it's, yeah, it's true it's in the interwebs <clears throat> so much is now yeah yeah, which is great. It makes it so much more accessible accessibility to so much so many more people. Right. Huge in in improvement, I think. And so we have the access to the technology, but then once people have access to it, they a lot like when people are interested in it after they've explored it, understood it, they're curious about it. It's sometimes hard for people to just like go home and take like a class on edX or Coursera and mm. just be able to have that self-discipline and just learn it without being able to talk to another human. So online learning is awesome. I've done it. Like it's how I got through a lot of different stuff and learned a lot of stuff. But some sessions started talking about learning hubs and learning communities. And so there have been some libraries that said, we got a LinkedIn subscription 
if you're curious about some classes, we're going to start bringing like a, we have like 12 different people that are interested in learning Excel. We have 20 different people that are learning about change management. We have 40 different people that are learning about like um, software development. We're gonna we're going to have these little meetup groups so that people can come into the library and they can take the class. So that's going to be your sense of accountability because you can't pay for in-person classes. That's too expensive or it's not on your schedule. But you're gonna come into the library or we have these open sessions so that you can drop in and just talk to people about it and start building your own little mini ecosystem so that you can keep growing and doing what you want to do. And then there's the, can these learning hubs only be online or are there different ways that you can build a hybrid learning hub or build access to hybrid resources to say that you can access our makerspace tools and you can access our curated information resources, but you can go into the physical library if you need to use a headset or into the physical library if you need to access our robotics kits, but you can also go to our main library website and start connecting over to a curated collection of resources. And we're changing the way the library is changing the way that we're tracking um, library use. So you're going to that digital first mentality, but then you're also tracking your not just the number of visits to your websites, but how long people stayed engaged with each different page, which points were clicked on that different page, what people actually interacted with, and starting to say, not just use that to inform your the design of your website, but using that to say, to justify the existence of your library, because that isn't always a metric that's put into all of your like the justification reports for like library boards. And some already do, some don't. I don't know how you're set up right now. And so then you have, and most libraries stop at access to technology. They say, we set up this amazing feature rich um, maker space. You've got a laser cutter over there. You've got a 3D printer over there. You've got some, a VR station over here. You've got some sensors and robotics over here. Go to town. Every so often, we have a trainer that comes in and shows you how to use it. But this is another thing that I talked about in the library problem session, and it's sort of a theme that's been cropping up in small ways, is you have access to technology, but how do you build access to the problems? People, like, the problem solving process isn't just about, you don't start with technology and then find problems to fit. So that's what, that is what has been happening. Instead, usually in that design process, you start with a collection of problems. You say that our organization has been, we're trying to build out new software. We are trying to experiment with machine learning to build a better suggestion model so that we can get people over to our books and resources better. We don't have the in-house resources to be able to do that, but we're going to post this problem on a little shared board that says, we just introduced artificial intelligence machine learning to our community. Now we're going to match it over to this problem to say, if you're curious about it, come try out your new skills or learn your new skills to solve our problem. And putting over to say, these are the pathways that you can use, join our learning hub or join our um, knowledge management system to be able to help you work through that process of using technology to solve these problems. So right now, most libraries have the access to the tech, but they don't have a library of problems. They don't have a brainstorming or an inspiration session to say, this is why we need technology. And so that's kind of one way that libraries can start shifting. And then this jumps back over into that knowledge management, which is the curation of the information resources to say what the tech is all about. Because there's a lot of like smoke oil in the tech field 
there's a lot of like boot camps that are just like not worth your time. There's a lot of people trying, like people with a million different opinions. So the library can help start vetting out these resources to say, this is what you need, go here. And on that note, I'll also put in this link to these high tech pages. As with everyone in library land, I do have to make some updates to these, but it's part of <laughs> So in the chat, I put in some of the curated information resources that um, pair up with this different technology that basically says what it's all about, some different activities and resources you can use to explore and experiment with it, and kind of what can go haywire if, all, if um, we don't care about using tech for good and just like a variety of different stuff. So you can check that out if you want to. And many of the resources that are in this session listing here gives you more information about um, how libraries have used the specific technology within their community, um, how they've started um, basically building like a decentralized makerspace system. So instead of saying all of our equipment is right here, we're going to start leveraging the mobile, the mobile makerspaces. We'll take it out and we'll, we're going to take this on the road. We're going to mail you over a tech kit so you can use it at home. We have make and take kits that just place. And the another one I wanted to highlight was the fostering entrepreneurship and library makerspace. Um, that was um, Nick Tansy, I think his last name is. Um, he talks about how libraries can support entrepreneurship in kind of a more comprehensive way. So that could be a helpful one if you're trying to do that in your own community. And um, the only one that doesn't have its presentation listed is Digital Twins Combining AR with VR and AR. But if you, I put it on there because if you are interested in Digital Twins, you can still Google it. You can use it as a keyword search so that you can start digging mm -hmm. around and exploring it on your own. And Chad Marin always gives an awesome update on XR, right. which is like augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, all that good stuff. Yep. So we've had him on on well you've had him on here on Encompass Live before. <laughs> yeah. Look at our yeah. archives for anything. Yeah. Just awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so then that goes into kind of our last little theme of the day, which is with all of this change and all of this new stuff going on you're pretty much always going to feel like you're falling. Like you're going to have every time you have to shift over to a new idea, new concept, new thing, new technology, most people are going to have that kind of plummety butterfly feeling in their stomach. And it's like, how do you make that shift over to say, we're not going to just let change happen. We're going to take control and shape that better future because eventually you land and you're all good. But in that moment, it doesn't feel like it. So how can you prepare as a library and as an individual to be a creator of change and a shaper of the future instead of just letting that moment happen? Because it's not a good feeling and we can do something about it. So some of the themes that came out in the sessions and just in general library land life from what I've seen around is the, the I'll point to the know your threat risk, then I'll actually tie you over to a specific slide deck. Um, the tea bags and hot water, if you go to the um, Stephen Abrams slide deck, he actually gives a really comprehensive kind of view of how libraries have been changing and like the re and like the changes that have stuck after COVID. And he also gives a really good framework for assessing the risks and the threats that are facing your library and ways that you can start to 
um, kind of basically take control of it instead of just letting it happen. So a lot of this actually came from that presentation. So that's like a really good slide deck to start sifting through. And I, I put digital curse in there just because it's freaking everywhere. And it's, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> And there's also the general theme that there's kind of like the, this was probably just the fact that all that everyone has wanted COVID to end, that we're kind of thinking that it's in the downswing and it's like, we're all good. But if you listen to like the Bill Gates trend and you listen to like the trend of scientists everywhere, mm -hmm. this is just one of many COVIDs. We're gonna have probably another pandemic that's going to come out. And if we don't oh, yeah. just keep preparing for it, you're going to be blindsided again. So that's sort of like your overarching threat that's just like in the times of COVID. And so some of these sessions also, if you look at the evaluation and adaptation, how change allowed us to thrive, shift back over to that tea bags and hot water and um, looking at the strategic tools, which also appeared previously in another theme, to start trying to change the way that you do community needs assessments, change the way that you structure and look at your organization, and accept and understand that the services that you have available right now are going to look drastically different if you want to survive in the future. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And they're just kind of tips and techniques to be able to do your library evaluations differently and start to work with partners to evaluate instead of just doing it specifically within the library. Because when you do your evaluations individually as an org like individually as an organization, you wind up duplicating resources, ignoring problems that you could be um, developing services around to bring more people in and starting to do that felt that reflection and evaluation systemically as a community instead of an organization. And mm -hmm. so I've already talked about this one a lot here, but if you do have any questions about it, you can go over to you know, email me about it. I know that I don't have all of the answers that you're looking for, <laughs> so you could also look at the at the most of these information sessions, most of the presenters gave their contact information at the end of their slide deck. So if you do have super specific questions, I would recommend just re reaching out to the speakers. They put their contact information because they like to know that people are actually out there listening to the words coming out of their mouth. And when they get questions, it feels good. Yeah. You know? And and they're happy to, to to chat with you. Definitely. I mean, these they are yeah. putting these presentations together for to share what they've figured out each yep. little piece yeah. and um definitely if there's something you're you know at the conference live in person they would have had people coming up and saying i want to talk more about this or let's go over here can we meet for coffee or something um but that can continue afterwards with emails then definitely um i know that I, like after my session i got that little warm feeling when people walked up and they went out for coffee and they had <laughs> questions and I was like, yeah, do listen. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and so I think we have about 10 minutes. So I do have a uh -huh. couple of things I can go over, but I'll see if there's any questions yeah. first. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, if anybody does have any questions, um, go ahead and type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, anything that Amanda mentioned that you wanted that you wanted to chat more about or explore? Um, any of these topics that she mentioned that you have any experience, thought, input on? <laughs> um, did any? You now I you know the whole the. Um, title of this session is what you missed from uh, Internet Librarian, but I wonder sometimes, is there anyone here who attended Internet Librarian and saw other sessions or something that you want to share about? Um, you could do that as well um, in the chat. Um, and you, you mentioned, huh? Can people unmute themselves with this? 
they can't i can do that for them yes if you want to be unmuted to share something i can i, I can do that yeah you can't do it yourself unless i do it on my side yeah okay yeah a little bit more control here um but like you mentioned earlier there's a lot here and a lot yeah. to go through yeah. and it's I me mean, it's a big conference it's how many days plus pre-conference i mean <clears throat> yeah and i also help with one of the like the games and gadgets workshop in right the monday at the start of it uh -huh. that was like that was actually one of the things i was going to talk about now if no one had any questions hmm. Um, I don't see anything coming in, no, but I'll keep an eye on it. if anyone does come up with anything. Like, as Amanda said, we still got ten, about 10 minutes left in our show time, so plenty of time to talk about things or show anything else. And so I will just talk about some of, like, the specific um, game gadget tech trends that came up just because I like them. There's always, like, uh, the, what we've done in the past is a technology petting zoos type things yeah um because you always you know there's always these new devices new tablets new just anything and you know not everybody can get their hands on it but it's great that some places can bring them together and say here we'll show you all of it <laughs> so what i'm going to do here is this was actually a slide that i meant to put together but life just didn't work out that way before before i put this together so I'm going to put together a tech gadget trends or tech gadget recommendations. And you're going to see me put this together live. Feel special. Yeah. I know. How to create slides live and in person. <laughs> so for AI, VR, and AR, which is artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and augmented reality and robotics. I just came across a new tech kit that's called Kai's Plan. So Kai's Plan is really awesome because it's kind of it's the only tech it's the only ed tech thing that I've come across that actually blends together the virtual world and robotics in the way that they do. So the way it works is that you have this giant adventure mat. You lay the adventure mat out on the floor, and then you have these little, I actually have one here. I'm setting it up for the library commission. But this is one of the little book box that has like a little zipper set. And it's got like a little QR code on the roof of his robot. You put this robot on top of that adventure mat, and then you can use it to pick up little objects on there you can navigate through the like physical world and they have like an automated warehouse mat and a mars rover mat those are the two that i have but it teaches the like the concepts of smart warehouses and it teaches the concept like practical applications of how this stuff is used and the augmented reality part of it comes in when you download it like a the kai's plan app onto your phone it's called kai's eye and you set up like a little camera station they give like a tripod with the kit and you aim your smartphone at the mat so that it can read all the qr codes on the mat and it builds a virtual world inside of the app that reflects what's physically happening in real space so you'll cool. see the physical robot moving on the mat but then you'll also see your virtual robot moving in virtual space. So this is starting to give the concept of that digital twin. It's starting to give that concept of prototyping physical environments in the virtual world while you are you're syncing the virtual and the physical world together. And it's just like it's really cool to be able to see that side by side. If you get a chance, go to Kai's plan, like just search for Kai's plan and watch the video of how it works. Because it's like the only thing that I found so far that actually blends all that together and really reflects how robotics and uh, how like that vid, like the digital world and the like the physical world is changing and how you can use that virtual world to start prototyping and building a better physical world to make that work better. And it's just really cool. I geek out and it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually gonna be one of the kits that's available through the, um, 
the tech kids that make kids through the mail that we do. Awesome. I was wondering if we were going to be getting some of those. <laughs> I already have. There's one right there. Yeah. It's very adorable there too. Yes. Yeah. And so that is the one that just came to mind immediately. The other one that just added an AI and robotics block was the Finch 2.0. And the Finch just started a new series of, so if you've heard of, um, uh, Google has its Teachable Machine, and mm -hmm. Teachable Machine introduces the machine learning concept that will allow a computer to recognize images, it'll recognize audio, and it'll recognize, like, like I used it to build, like, a robot that uses, that will navigate a maze using voice commands. Mm -hmm. So I went into Google's Teachable Machine, and it's just like you don't need to know how to code. You just go into it, give it a bunch of different examples of one word, and then you can train a model that will understand. Um, it's it's limited to one second long words, so I had to use all one syllable words. But now I can recognize go left, right, and in, then I program the robot to be able to respond based on those commands. And the Finch 2.0 made by Burnbury Technology, it has like a whole tutorial that will show you how to do it. And then what I did was just adapt it to build the maze. Mm -hmm. And so this is a session that um that's was uh your your pretty sweet tech session at the end of September. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah program your robot yeah. using voice commands, yeah. And so I put that one in there just in case you want to be able to play around with that. And then another one that came up was the, so a lot of times I feature like the technology that's like um, kind of some of it's big, like the Finch 2.0 has a beginner level. The AI part of it is probably more intermediate to advanced. So for people that are working more toward like the beginner end of the spectrum, um, a lot of you have probably heard about the Ozobot Evo. It's mm -hmm. been on back order forever and a day. I ordered mine through Ediporium's website and Ediporium will let you do a pre-order, but um, I don't think it's going to get shipped out until January. Like I think that's what their tech support told me. But the Ozobot Evo is the one that is screen free and code free options. So you use um, colored markers to draw a little, you can either draw a straight black line and then the robot will follow that line and change color to match that, the color of the line. Or you can draw little color, like color codes. It's basically like a pattern drawn in marker on a piece of paper that tells the robot whether it should spin around, turn left, right, or go forward. And it's a way to introduce those coding concepts without like all you need is the robot and some paper and markers. And I recommend the chisel tip markers because if you use the round tip markers, the robot won't follow it right. Just saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's probably not in there, huh? <laughs> um, it might be in there, but I don't know. It doesn't hurt to say it. And so for absolute beginners and younger users. And then some story-driven tech is the... And I'm going to double-check the, the name of this because... I always get it like a tiny bit wrong. Uh, okay, the Tony box. So the Tony box is just kind of a fun one because it's basically like a giant speaker cube and it's you can put little figurines on top of it. Like they have a whole Disney line of figurines. And when you put that figurine on top of the box, the box will start telling stories or it'll start playing little songs. And it's just like a, it's a way to keep kids entertained and start building like a little interactive object. So you can tilt the box one way, it'll rewind, you can like shake it, it'll change tracks, you can tilt it and it'll fast forward. So it's like that tactile cool. device for super young users. So if you're looking, and you can also record your own stories if you have a certain figurine that you can put on top. So it's kind of a way to, it's a very fun tool for libraries, just because stories. 
and I've seen ads for that. I didn't realize how much it could do though, <laughs> or yeah. how much they could, how much the children could do with them. Yeah. And so if you want to kind of give students, like give kids a voice when they're trying to tell their own story and then make it like interactive and tactile, it's just a cool way to do it. And then I'm going to jump over to, oh, the other cool thing that I saw was, and a lot of you have probably seen this one already, but it's like a, it's used for webinars and conferences. And it's a speaker in the shape of an owl. And that yes. little owl, you probably, yeah. You we're we're it. getting one here. We're getting one at the commission. Are we finally getting one? Yes, fine. I just yes. got email yesterday. Okay. <laughs> yes. But yeah, this owl um, yeah, webcam. Yeah, if you want to yes. describe it, go for it. It's oh, it's slick. Um, it it looks like an owl. Yes, <laughs> um, yeah. it do just look like owl. Oh, Joe W L um, vir, uh, virtual meeting webcam or something. Um, and it in one piece of equipment is your um microphone, speaker, and a three hundred and sixty degree camera. Yeah. So that if you sit that in the middle of a room, you have a conference table and a whole bunch of people in it, and you have people coming in remotely as well, everyone can, people coming in remotely can see everybody in that table. There's a panoramic view of everyone, so you can see everyone who's at the table. It is motion and sound activated when someone speaks a new, like here, if you can see here, you've got my my uh, webcam box and Amanda's. Um, the um, owl would have um, a panoramic view of the whole room, but then when someone speaks, a second camera or multiple other camera view will pop up a new window and zoom into that person's face. Yeah. And if another person speaks, it'll zoom into that one. And I've seen it do up to three different people zoomed in. So you can, rather than just seeing this big room of just people way far away, you see that, but you see, um, it, it zooms in closer and then it will pop to someone else who's talking because it goes by it does it automatically by sound um sound and motion i think but mostly good sound but um oh it's so slick and so um yes all of our regional library systems have them um, they've just gotten them within the last few months um using some arpa grant funds or other funds that they had and um, well, we tested it out a couple weeks ago at a meeting here borrowed one and it was uh, so well received that now we are purchasing our own <laughs> for um, meetings here that we host at the Library Commission. So it's a good way to combine um, people who are meeting in person with people who are remoting in from other locations all in one shot, um, all in one. Makes it much more personal, um, seeing the people's faces up close, seeing it pop around to people. Um, and it's just one piece of equipment. Previously, we would have to plug in a microphone, a speaker, a webcam, all into whatever computer is running that um, remote the uh, hosting's location. One device is all it is. And it looks like an owl. It lights up with little mm -hmm. eyes. And when you first boot it up, turn it on, it it, it hoots at you. Yeah, <laughs> just a little hoot. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's I didn't know about the hoot. <laughs> but it's, it's cute, but it's such an awesome technology. Highly recommend it, yes. And I really want to play with that now. <laughs> well, I just got the email yesterday. So we're getting it, so we'll see when it comes in. And so on here, I also added the Pi Talk, which is basically the Raspberry Pi made easier so that it actually has more curated, understandable tutorials instead of like the wild, wild west of Raspberry Pi Pi tutorials that are out there now. Yeah. So if you want to learn circuitry and learn sensors and learn robotics or learn hardware and all that stuff without losing your mind trying to find tutorials that are actually legitimately for beginners then you can also you can use PyTalk to learn the internet of things um artificial intelligence like and robotics so i added that one and i'll put in the concepts you learn here ai robotics Hi, Hi, And I see that we're at 11.05, so I won't keep you too much longer here. Um, I'll ask one more time if there are any other questions, but then I'll just let you wrap it up.
Let's see. Um, yeah, nothing came in. Anybody have any uh, last minute desperate questions you want to ask of Amanda or anything you want to comment on? Um, and so this is her presentation here and she'll send me the link. Um, we'll get that uh, on our Google slide so we can um, share that with you all. And I will put this in to the chat here. Yeah. Where's my chat box? Oh, there it is. It's moved. Um, yeah, so I'll share the link to you all now, but it will also be available um, when the recording is up as well. So if you don't grab it right now, that's okay, um, as usual. Uh, let's send it over here too. Uh, it will be on the archive page as always. There it goes. Whoops. Gotta hit send before something will send. Oh, it'll do that. Yeah. All right. Um, just some thank yous coming through right now. So I think we can, yeah, do a little wrap up here. I am going to move over here. Pull back, pres pull present your control to my screen here so I can do my wrap up. Okay. Yeah, if anyone does have any questions, go ahead and type them in. I've got a few last minute things to do here. Um, thanks so much, Meta. This is great. Um, every um, There's two companion conferences, I would say. Um, Internet Librarian in the fall in Monterey, California, when it's in person, and uh, Computers and Libraries Conference, which is in the spring in uh, Washington. In March. March. I'll be yeah. Looking at that one too. So if you can make it. Please. Yeah, in Arlington, Virginia, typically um, when it's in person. Um, of course, they did it virtual for the last few years, and now they're going um, getting back into in person as as some places are um, doing some um, hybrid events too, which is great when there's some a little of both. Uh, yeah. So um, and Amanda has come on before to talk about both those conferences sometimes. So this is great to always get. Um, like I said, in, in um, what did you miss? What uh, how cool? What topics? What are the trends? Um, as I mean, I said, it's not a. I always liked it when I would. I used to go. Um, it's not a huge conference with like an ALA where there's like twenty thousand people. It's it's a much smaller group, so there's a lot more. Um, it's not as overwhelming. I think um, it is very you know techy related. You know, it's the internet conference for librarians and information managers, but it is you know a lot of technology related things. Um, but it's, I think it's broadening out to all sorts of topics, but it's a lot of smaller groups, so you can get a lot more, I think, networking in um, with other people, and um, it's not as uh, overwhelming, I think, as some of those gigantic conferences. Like, those giant ALA ones, you can barely even think and breathe. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's nice in Internet Librarian to, in the fall to go to Monterey, California. Yeah, yeah. It was my first time there. Yeah. Because it's been virtual for so long now. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, as I said, we are recording and um, I will show you here. I'll get over to our Encompass Live page. Um, if you go, if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, we're the only thing called that on the internet. Um, that will bring you to our main page. We have our upcoming shows and our archive shows are listed here. Most recent one at the top of the page. So this is last week's show here. Um, today's will be here. Um, when it is ready, I will email everyone who attended today's show and uh, registered registered for today's show to let you know when the recording is ready. Um, I've got to export it. It's got to come out of GoToWebinar, go onto our YouTube channel, and then I'll take some time getting that ready. I uh, should be sometime tomorrow when that's all done. Uh, while I'm here, I'll show you there is a search feature for our, in our archives. You can search our full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something just current. And that is because this is our full show archives. Um, if I went all the way to the bottom of this page, it would go back to 2009 when um, Encompass Live first premiered. Um, as long as we have a place to host our recordings, we will always have them up here. Um, but do pay attention when you do watch an archive recording to the original broadcast date. Some shows will stand the test of time and still be good, good information. Some things will become old, outdated, um, things have changed, links might be broken, resources may be totally different. 
Uh, people who presented may be working at a totally different library now. <laughs> uh, so just pay attention to that if you are watching any of our archive shows. Um, you can look up, Amanda, if you want to know all Amanda's shows, look up her name or um, Pretty Sweet Tech. And I'd mentioned the one you said, uh, you're programming a robot using voice commands, that Finch 2.0 that she was mentioning. That's a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago. Um, you can find all of her sh um, shows in our archives there as well. Um, we also do have a Facebook page. If you like to um, follow us on Facebook and give us a like, we do reminders out there of here's when to log in right now, um, meet our speakers, uh, we let people know when the recordings are up. Um, also on Twitter and Instagram, we use the NCUMP Live hashtag for anything related to NCUMP that's live. I'll so here, here's the link for the slides that you'll get afterwards and to that high tech um, page that Amanda had shared. So things about them. And we kind of briefly mentioned the tech kits that are available. These are for Nebraska libraries. You can request tech kits through the mail um, to test out things. Um, Amanda has put together, we have multiples of a lot of these, correct? Um, there's 15 copies of most of them. Yeah. So if you want to borrow something to either do a program at your library or just to learn about the, the, the robot or the drone or whatever that you've never been able to get your hands on before, you can borrow them from here at the Library Commission. This is for Nebraska libraries. And a few other states have asked me about um, duplicating this system. So if you're oh. from another state and you want to set up a similar system, you can also email me and I can help you work through that. Right, to tell how Amanda, because this has been, it's been doing this for a couple of years now. I know it started out yeah. kind of as a, a soft launch and then became more. <laughs> I mean, COVID happened, so that kind of. Right, it was right with things. Yeah. And as you see, that's what those boxes behind you you were talking about. That's our part of our, <laughs> in your camera there behind you, the tech kits yeah. the things that would be sent out. That's why my office is a hot mess. <laughs> um, so that'll wrap it up for today's show um, I'll be joining us in a future episode um, Amanda will be back of course last Wednesday of the month December 28th, January 25th um, I am working on getting some things scheduled you can see here I don't have anything on the calendar officially yet for the next couple of weeks but I'm in conversations with people uh, I got, just got to get some confirmations done so keep an eye on our schedule here one last thing I do want to mention is, in addition to doing this weekly show here on Compass Live, we also at the Nebraska Library Commission host the Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. Um, this is a national conference with presenters from all across the country and sometimes elsewhere. We've had Canadian people from Canada as well. And it is co-sponsored by the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. This is a conference specifically where small libraries are the presenters. Um, all of our presenters are from libraries with a um, population served or an FTE of 10,000 or less. That is our definition of small. So if um, the conference is always the last Friday of February, it's done online exclusively, it's just online using our GoToWebinar software like we're doing here. And the call for speakers is open now. Uh, the deadline is Friday, December 16th to submit a proposal to our conference. So please do, um, if you are a small library, submit a proposal to me. Um, or if you know of one that should sh you think they should share something that they're doing, uh, send them over to our site. We do 50-minute um, presentations and we do a lightning round session and over the lunchtime hour. So, so, so if you just have a short session, 10-minute uh, presentation, you can do that as well. So please do submit proposals to that and spread the word for me, please. Please spread the word. Like I said, this is a national conference. This is not a Nebraska thing. We're just the one that happens to host it. Um, presenters and attendees from all across the country, anywhere, all across the world, anybody can attend. It's free and open to anybody, just like our Encompass Live. All right, so that wraps it up for today's show. I don't see any other last minute desperate questions, so I think that's it for today. Thank you so much, Amanda. Good to see you again. Thank you everybody for being here with us and we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye. <laughs>